Hello there, you are welcome to this edition of Star Today here on Star FM. I am Tutuwa Danso. Let's hear the stories coming up this hour. And coming up this evening, security analyst backs NDC's decision not to sign any peace declaration pact, given the silence of the National Peace Council on past and current happenings in the country. NDC has legitimate concerns uh, because there cannot be peace without justice. Um, it is quite unfortunate that after uh, those violence that led to the death of about eight Ghanaians, nobody has been held to account. I mean, in as much as I'd love all the political parties and other stakeholders to sign. Also in this broadcast, the chairman of of Public Administration and State Interest Committee slams GTEC over what attempts half-baked master's programs from universities in the country. I am extremely uncomfortable about the quality of our scholarship as people. Increasingly, we're seeing the growth of weekend courses, the growth of evening courses with the same duration. Tonight, we are live at the Ghana Tertiary Education Commission. And later on the broadcast, the Institute for Energy Security predicts stability in prices of petroleum products in the second window of August 2024. On the international market, we've seen a decrease in prices uh, for gasoline and gas oil. They continue to be uh, positive. That prices continue to decrease. And so for gasoline, it, uh, we saw 2.83% decrease. And then for gas oil, which is diesel, it decreased by 4.46%. And now when you look at the LPG, LPG more or less increased a little. It increased about 2.66%. Also later in this bulletin, on the campaign trail, we will bring you an update of the NPP's manifesto on Sunday. There are details of these and many other stories in this broadcast. Do stay with us. <music> Star News is coming to you live on Ultimate 106.9 FM in Kumasi, Empire 102.7 FM in Takrade, Cool 103.5 FM in Ho, Ridge and Might FM in Tamale, Sonali FM in Wa, My Star Radio in the USA. Also live on Facebook on Star 103.5 FM and on starfm.com.gh around the world. This is Star 103.5 FM. Thank you very much for choosing us this evening. Remember the bulletin is streaming live on our Facebook platform at Star FM. Now the governing New Patriotic Party says the peace and stability of Ghana is not the sole responsibility of the National Peace Council but a collective one. The governing party is not happy with the decision of the opposition NDC not to sign the accord ahead of the general election in December. The opposition party's national, national chairman, Johnson Esiedun Kitsia, in an interview with Accra-based Joy News, claimed his party was tricked into signing the peace accord in 2020. He disclosed that the NDC will not sign a peace accord this year due to what they say is the silence of the National Peace Council regarding some violence in the 2020 elections which led to the death of some Ghanaians. Take a listen to what the chairman said. It doesn't mean anything to us because all previous declarations have not been adhered to and those declarations have not solved any problem. If you allow uh, violence to be brewed, you have violence whether you sign declaration <laughs> or not. And so that is why for more than a year ago I started uh, talking about the need for us to remove the the, the, the building blocks for a violent elections. So at any stage when something is happening, I call on those who in future will call us to sign declarations to speak up so that we stop this particular thing from happening. Otherwise, if you allow all those things to, uh, to build up and you say that, let us go and play peace football match, let us sign declaration. Let us do this with the hope that we will get a peaceful election. Peaceful election will not happen. Because we did all this in 2020. All this and more. 
in 2020, uh, Council of State, uh, Peace Council, everybody was involved signing declarations left, right, center. The 2020 election turned out to be the most violent elections in the whole of the uh, Fourth Republic. Johnson is here doing KCI as the national chairman of the opposition NDC. Now, the NPP, in a statement issued by its general secretary, Justin Frimpong Kudya, condemned the party's position while calling on them to reconsider it. The NPP finds the comments by the NDC national chairman very unfortunate and condemns it in no uncertain terms, given the worrying nature of the statement. We have noted with concern that the leadership of the NDC has gained notoriety for consistently beating the drums of war and preparing the minds of their supporters to reject the outcome of the 2024 general elections, foreseeing their inevitable loss. The NPP wishes to make a passionate appeal to the NDC to reconsider their posture by reason of the national interest and desist from making statements likely to fuel tensions in the political atmosphere with far-reaching implications for the peace and security of our dear country. We wish to reiterate our firm assurance to Ghanaians that the NPP remains solely committed in words and in deeds to maintaining the peace and stability of this country before, during and after the 2024 elections and will accept its outcome in good faith. While we reiterate our commitments to signing the 2024 election peace declaration with alacrity, we call on the National Peace Council, civil society organizations, religious and traditional authorities, and indeed all well-meaning Ghanaians to join us in condemning the statement by the NDC national chairman and to urge the party to use appropriate channels to resolve any grievances. Ironically, despite the NDC's stated stance, they continue to be represented at the Peace Council, IPAC, and national security meetings. Why are they unable to maintain a principal stance? to the peace and stability of Ghana. Finally, we want to remind the NDC that Ghanaians are peace-loving people and by the grace of God, Ghana will not experience any war regardless of the outcome of the 2024 general elections. The will of the Ghanaians will always prevail. That was a statement released by the New Patriotic Party and signed by the General Secretary Justin Frimpong Kudya. But reacting to the decision of the NDC, a Deputy Communications Director of the Dr. Baumia campaign, Akbar Khomeini, told GH1 TV that it is not the sole responsibility of the National Peace Council to ensure peace and stability of the country. The peace of our country is not the exclusive responsibility of the Peace Council. You know, is it not nice that Ghana is stable and peaceful, that we are all going about our legitimate duties? Is it not nice? Must, must, must it be the responsibility of the Peace Council to say to us that we must conduct ourselves in a very peaceful manner? We all owe a duty to this country to keep it peaceful. The Peace Council is just a facilitating body, all right? But it is not their exclusive responsibility. Indeed, it is not the sole responsibility of political parties, all right? It is the responsibility of every single Ghanaian, whether you are recognized in the formal structures of the state or not. You owe it a duty to keep our country peaceful so that we all can continue to engage in our legitimate um, affairs and drive the benefit that nationhood offers to all of us. So I don't think that it is correct to say that because you have reservations about the conduct of the peace council then you are not committed to maintaining the peace and stability of our country if there's war the effect will not just be for the members of the peace council i would suffer it you would suffer it i said in Ketia would suffer it john draman in mahama would suffer it dr mahmoud baumia would suffer it in fact people who are not interested in the politics of our country would suffer it we should not assume that you know, every citizen is very interested in the politics of our country and therefore politicians can engage in activities which affects them. Not everybody is interested in politics, but everybody must be interested in the peace and stability of our country. You just listened to Agbar Khomeini, a deputy direct yeah. communications director of the Dr. Baumia campaign. Let's now have a conversation with Adib Sani, who is a security analyst, for more on this development. Adib, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Now, from where you sit as an analyst, what do you make of the position of the NDC, especially at a time that we are preparing for one of the toughest elections in the country's history? Well, I couldn't have agreed with you more. Shortly, it's going to be tough. Um, however, I'm a bit disappointed with their um, um, decision not to be part of it because it sends 
wrong signals to uh, their party supporters. Um, however, they have said some things that uh, I find legitimate in one way or another. Uh, because the same peace party was signed uh, prior to the 2020 elections. Um, unfortunately, it turned violent to a large degree. People died. And uh, to date, nobody has been held to account. So they feel that um, if we have done it in 2020 and uh, nobody has been held to account, yet there was also violence, what's the possibility things might change um, in, in, in 2024? And so um, it is quite concerning. But what surely it means is uh, this election is going to be very decisive. There's a need for all stakeholders, including the media, to work more to ensure it is peaceful, it is fair, and it's credible. I mean, despite the concerns raised by the NDC, don't you think that if we keep this posture of the fact that since the National Peace Council will not do anything to promote peace in the country and so, there is no need to sign any peace pacts, don't you think it is rather going to foster violence? Well, like I indicated, I can't dispute the fact that it might send the wrong message uh, to, to their supporters. However, it's a wake-up call to the Peace Council. And I've always indicated that the, the institution has become a statement-issuing institution. Instead of living up to what they were, you know, they, 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 they have come, they, I mean, they, they, they were made to do, sort of, because it's an institution under the Ministry of Interior. And they are supposed to uh, promote peace. Uh, they, are, they have a role in conflict. Uh, resolution. They are supposed to also advise government to engage in public education and a whole lot. The question is, to what extent have they been able to do that? I, I think rather what they do lately is um, firefighting, wait until things get out of hand, and uh, they, they receive public back, backlash and in an attempt to reverse that, they come, with it, they come out with a statement. But recently, a lot of things has happened, including statements by Honorable Bernie Champong. We've had equally incendiary statements by some members of the NDC, including one which uh, opined that if you bring out your uh, dagger, would also bring out ours, which obviously is a declaration of war. And, and so I think the Peace Council really has a lot of more work to do. Uh, I don't think they are able, they are capable of doing it alone. That is why CS tools exist. And, and these money that goes into the peace council, trust me, I think if it had gone to CSOs, they would have been able to do a better job. Right. Adib, I mean, since you say the National Peace Council has become a statement-issuing organization, what then is your relevance when it comes to peace building in the country? That, that is the, the, my, my, my challenge. Um, I think they are extremely relevant within the scheme of things, but just that they've not been able to live up to expectations. Um, civil society is doing more. I mean, for example, the Just Case Center for Human Security and Peace Building is doing a lot of public education. Just um, on, uh, I think, tomorrow Saturday um, at around 9 a.m. at the National Mosque, we are even engaging the youth, trying to make them understand that this is just a democratic exercise. It's not a war situation. We have gone out there, we've gone to the Zongos, we've made them understand that politicians are friends. And so if you are fighting with your neighbor in the name of politics, then surely you don't understand what this whole thing is all about. So we are doing the very best we can. But this council has the biggest, I mean, the bigger voice and could have been able to do more than uh, they are doing. That is why I think government should focus more on the CSOs. Should they still be maintained or the council should be scrubbed off totally? I mean, they, they can be maintained, just that there's a need for a total overhaul. It is an important institution, that I cannot uh, deny. Um, however, I think it's one of its biggest issues is um, uh, leadership. If we are able to get the right people to do the right thing, I think it should be one of the most important institutions in Ghana. But like I indicated, focus should also be placed on civil society and a uh, very important role they can play in harnessing our democracy. Now, Adiba, I'd like to understand, do you think the Peace Council's issues is because they are handicapped financially or because there are some political undertones with regards to the administration now? I don't think it's, you would require millions of dollars to um, put pressure 
on stakeholders, including government, to ensure justice. Uh, because, I mean, l- let's be realistic. There, there cannot be peace without justice. Okay, and I don't think this council needs such a lot of uh, such money to be able to call for that to happen. In recent times, we've had a lot of issues that has come up that causes significant threats to the security of the state. And I think the Peace Council hasn't really done enough. Um, another issue is preventative diplomacy. Um, to what extent has the Peace Council engaged various stakeholders to ensure that they cease fire? They stop talking irresponsibly on radio and TV as it has serious uh, ramifications I mean, on, on the security of the state, especially as we go into this year's election. So for me, I'm up. I mean, any day, any time, I think Peace Council should exist. However, there's a need for overhaul. Uh, we need the right uh, people on board, and hopefully they will be able to do better than they are doing. Right. And finally, before I let you go, with regards to all of these challenges that you have touted within the Peace Council, would you encourage the NDC to sign the peace pact? Well, I would encourage them to do so. However, I would also expect, on the other hand, uh, the Peace Council to be more proactive, to reach out to them and to prove that they are doing uh, something to ensure justice is served. And they are also doing something to address the myriad of, myriad of threats uh, that is culminating as a result of um, the run-up to the post in, uh, on, on December 7th. Um, I've also realized uh, that we don't um, build peace. We like to keep the peace. And that is what my center, Jetsky Center for Human Security and Peace Building, uh, seeks to do. We don't have to wait until it's election time before we beg for peace. Things are not done that way. Uh, we have to build it. We have to make the people understand the intrinsic value of peace. Uh, we, and a lot of violence happens because of ignorance, my dear. Um, we have other security challenges, especially the proliferation of small arms and light weapons. What are we doing about it? Uh, what is the Peace Council doing about it? I think they need to do more to address these issues. If really we are committed to um, dealing with the issue once and for all. Mm. Adib, thank you very much. Adib Sani is a security analyst with the JCK Security Services. You are still listening to Start today. We are right back after this breather. Don't go away. With the facts from the 90th cycle, we are pleased to announce the doubling 100% increase of the bi-monthly cash grants for beneficiary households of the Livelihood Empowerment Against Poverty LEAP program. As a result, the LEAP cash grant for one eligible member household has been increased from 128 Ghana cities to 256 Ghana cities. Two eligible member households increased from 150 to Ghana cities to 304 Ghana cities. Three eligible member households increased from 176 Ghana cities to 352 Ghana cities and four eligible member households increased from 212 Ghana cities to 424 Ghana cities. The payment to beneficiary households starts on 12 August 2024 nationwide. Caregivers should count your money before leaving the pay point or bank or ask your community volunteer or the social welfare officer to assist. Do not accept any amount paid to them which is less than expected. Demand your receipt after being paid and keep it for reference. Caregivers, do not give any part of your money to anyone for any reason. Caregivers must spend the money on their household's nutrition and children's education and invest in income generating activities. This is important because the households will not be on the program forever. Please report concerns about the program to the community focal person or complaints to your community volunteer, district social welfare officer, or these toll-free numbers 0800-800-800 or 0800-900-900. The message is from the Ministry of Gender children and social protection and the leap management secretariat start today first fast and credible 
You're welcome back. The program is Star Today, and I am Tituwa Dansu. Let's do education now. And the chairman for the Public Administration and State Interest Committee, Dr. Kwabna Donko, has slammed management of the Ghana Tertiary Education Commission over what he terms poor master's programs by some universities in the country. Now, many universities in the country offer master's program for workers on weekends and evenings for the same duration as regular students. According to the Pru East MP, this process produces how big master's holders, given the limited time, addressing the media, Dr. Donko accused management of GTEC of the universities of exploiting the development as a money-making venture, slamming leadership of GTEC of, is, of sleeping on the job. I am extremely uncomfortable about the quality of our scholarship as people. Particularly, the increasing number of substandard master's programs being run by our universities. Best practice elsewhere is that if a full-time program has a duration of one year, a part-time program will be two years. Increasingly, we're seeing the growth of weekend courses, the growth of evening courses, with the same duration as full-time courses. There is no way a weekend program will have the same consistency and quality as a full-time program if you compress that into the same time frame. I, at 10.23, the Ghana Tertiary Education Commission has responsibility to accredit universities, to accredit programs, and also to ensure the quality of programs. Their responsibilities include liaising with industry to develop curricula that meets the need of industry. Unfortunately, the Ghana Tertiary Education Commission has gone to sleep on the job. We have all our public universities. I am worried because Ghana is uniquely positioned in the West African sub-region to be the educational hub, to attract students from across the sub-region and also contribute to national revenue and the growth of our GDP. But if we bastardize the quality, we will lose that unique position. You just heard Dr. Kwabna Donko. We are bailed to speak with Jitter for, for some answers, but unfortunately, they are not answering the calls at the moment. You're still listening to Star today. Let's focus on fuel now. And the Institute for Energy Security is predicting stability in the prices of petroleum products in the second window, starting August 16, 2024. According to the IES, the performance of gasoline and gas oil continues to remain positive, recording a price decrease of 2.82% and 4.46%. The IES in a statement says, due to the combined effects of the slowed depreciation of the local currency and the international market activities observed in the first half of the August 2024, petroleum prices will remain stable. Star News is coming to you live on Ultimate 106.9 FM in Kumasi, Empire 102.7 FM in Takrade, Cool 103.5 FM in Ho, Ridge and Might FM in Tamale, Sungali FM in Wa, My Star Radio in the USA. Also live on Facebook on Star 103.5 FM and on starfm.com.gh around the world. This is Star 103.5 FM. Well, let's now have a conversation with research analyst with the Institute of for Energy Security, Derek Jacha, who's joined me over the phone lines for more. Thank you very much for your time, sir. Now, you say we should expect stability in the prices of petroleum products. What are the factors pointing to this indication? All right. Uh, 
right. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, for the second pricing window of uh, August, we expect prices to be stable at the various stores, basically because of two factors. The first one is the international prices. On the international mar- uh, market, prices have seen some decline. So uh, for gasoline, or uh, which is uh, gasoline, that is petrol, it decreased by 2.83%. And then for diesel or gas oil, it saw 4.46 percentage reductions. Uh, just that LPG didn't see that reduction. LPG went up by 2.66 percent. Uh, now the second factor uh, accounting for this is the uh, exchange rate. So over the past two weeks, the CD also lost some value. It depreciated, uh, but the value of depreciation was a bit insignificant. It was depreciated by 0.77 percent. And so combining these two factors, we expect that prices at the various pumps will remain stable. And so given the current percentage decrease in the petroleum products, how much will fuels should be, be selling for? And so for fuels we sell it, we are talking about stability. So if it's going to be stable, it means that the same prices that we experienced for the first pricing window is what basically pri- uh, that is supposed to reflect for the second pricing window. And so it's not that we are going to see any marginal reduction or even if there will be any form of reduction, it depends on the pricing strategy for that particular OMC. And so for IES, what we expect is that prices will remain largely stable. For any reduction, it depends on the, uh, the pricing strategy of those particular OMCs. So you say that, for instance, if fuel at the moment or petrol at the moment sells for 14 Ghana cities per litre, we're not expecting it to drop to maybe 13 Ghana cities. We don't expect any reduction. We expect stability. Stability means that the prices are supposed to remain the same. Uh, for LPG, it's likely that some sort of uh, some people might adjust, uh, adjust prices to go up a little. But for petrol and diesel, we expect prices to remain the same. If there's any OMC that will be able to reduce their prices, then it means that they have a better uh, uh, pricing strategy. As I stated, the city depreciated by 0.7%. And then uh, for the international prices, it saw a reduction of almost five uh, percent for diesel, and then two point uh, below three percent for uh, petrol. And so, if you combine these two, it means that there's some sort of excess of almost two percent, and that two percent gives the OMCs a lean way to either to reduce their prices or, on average, their prices to remain stable. Mm. Now, you also say that the prices of LPG you didn't see any significant decline. Why is that? Does it also alter these factors that you've talked about? And so on the international market, LPG saw an increase in prices. And so on the international market, basically Ghana did not have any control by it. It's a positive of demand and supply. And so on that, uh, in that regard, uh, LPG saw an upward price that is uh, increasing by zero, uh, increasing by two point six eight percent and six eight percent. And so for this particular factor, uh, it went up. Now, on the international uh, local market, or let me say the local forex market, it saw a depreciation. And so combining an increase in price on the international market and then the city depreciating, definitely that is two negative effects. And so for LPG, uh, 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 the, 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 the stations can easily adjust their prices upward. Right. Thank you very much for your time this evening. Derek Jache is a research analyst with the Institute for Energy Security. Now, let's head to the eastern region in the Shai Traditional Council, where it has announced that this year's Nyang Mayam Festival will focus on environmental sustainability, with particular emphasis on protecting the Dodua Forest Reserve, which has come under significant threat from encroachment in recent years. Now, the Greater Accra Regional Security Council, RegSeg, recently declared the Dodua Forest situated in the Shai Osudoku district a security zone following concerns of destruction raised by the Greater Accra Regional House of Chiefs. Kojo Ansa has the details and the supports. The Dodua Forest, a renowned tourist destination and home to the Chenku Waterfall, is steeped in history as the site of the Katamansu War in 1826. However, substantial portions of the forest have been lost to estate development and other human activities. In response, RedSec and the Forestry Commission recently demolished buildings that had encroached on the reserve. The launch of this year's Mayam Festival, themed Promoting Environmental Sustainability Through Our Cultural Heritage, Chairman of the Festival Planning Committee, Okukrubo, Tai Kwesi Ajiman V, reiterated the Council's commitment to safeguarding the forest. To protect the environment and also we want to do this through 
our culture. Nene Tete Huaji, the sixth of Apetechi, also announced that the traditional council would lead a massive tree planting initiative to rejuvenate the forest's vegetation. He hinted of the use of a master site plan to clear all encroachments and restore the integrity of the reserve. Very good. Uh, this Dodua Forest issue has coincided with our, our festival and it's also in link with our, our theme for, for the festival. What we are going to do is right from here, we are now going to program ourselves into serious tree planting at, 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 at the forest, uh, places that have been destroyed and whatnot. So we are going to put ourselves into groups. Every month, one particular group will go there for tree planting and we'll put people also to supervise whatever tree we are planted, uh, planted to make sure it grows to, to, to resustain the, 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 the forest. When uh, your own documentation are not uh, appropriate, so we are going to be on the site plan to make sure that whoever has entered is, is, is taken off from the place and will protect our, our, our boundaries. We also have a plan with some uh, philanthropists that will, will fence the whole place or will uh, plant special trees on the, on the boundaries to make sure this is uh, a no-go area for whoever wants to enter the place. This year's Mayam festival commenced on 23rd September in the Manya Jopanya community and climax on 21st October in Kodiabe. Preceding the festival, a ban on noise making will be enforced across the shy traditional area from 10th September to 14th October. Mankralo Teche Wayo III of the Shy Traditional Council noted that while a task force led by traditional priests and priestesses will enforce the ban, however, a compromise will be made on political activities due to ongoing campaigns ahead of the 7th December polls. Please. At the end of the day, we just want to maintain the customary rights that we want to perform during the uh, currency of the bank. That is all we talked about. Uh, we know the acrimony that happens, especially with the two major political parties. Uh, we've spoken with our two priests, and I gave it, we've given them the modalities for how they will operate during the ban. The Mayim Festival named after the millet grain, Nma, carries deep cultural significance for the Krobo people. You just heard Kojuan says reports there. Now, the Institute for Fiscal Studies is urging governments to adopt what it terms a productive sharing agreement with the aim of generating increased revenue from the natural resources sector and thereby alleviating the tax burden on citizens. Now, the Institute posits that this approach must serve as the cornerstone of government's revenue mobilization, given that the country is the most natural resource endowed on the continent. They also recommended that the government revise the existing exploration of contractual agreements to align with best practices in other jurisdictions where resource owners reap greater benefits than investors. Leslie Dwight Mensa is an economist at IFS. I mean, we at the IFS believe that the, the management of our natural resources should be the cornerstone of our revenue strategy. Right. You know, Ghana has a bigger natural resource sector than the average African country, right. than the average middle-income country. We're the biggest gold producer mm -hmm. in, 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 in Africa, and there are not that many oil producers in Africa also. Yet, the, the, the proportion of extractive sector revenues mm -hmm that is captured by the Ghanaian state is paradoxically lower than the proportion in the average African country and in the average middle-income country. Because the, you know, the beauty of being blessed with natural resources is that if you can manage it well and get more from it, mm -hmm. you can tax less. We think that it should drive the revenue strategy. Mm -hmm. The evidence we have examined shows that mm -hmm. the countries that prosper greatly from the natural resource endowments are those places where the state interest is significant or the contractual arrangements are you know very different from what we have we, we produce well the independent square is one of the iconic monuments in ghana but has been in complete disrepair for a long time due to neglect by authorities. However, construction works have begun following series of reports by Star News on the poor state of the monument. There are more details in this report. Today, I'm standing before the once iconic Black Star Square, a symbol of Ghana's rich history and struggle to win independence. A few months ago on GH1 News, we brought you a series of reports highlighting 
the poor state of this once iconic structure. Due to years of neglect and poor maintenance, the Independence Arc, once a proud symbol of Ghana's heritage, had fallen into complete disrepair. Crumbling walls, faded inscriptions and overgrown surroundings painted a sorrowful picture of a nation's treasure which had long been forgotten. However, I'm pleased to bring you an update on the current situation. A few months after our initial reports, construction work has begun, signaling a renewed commitment to preserving our national monuments. As you can see behind me, workers are on site, diligently working to restore the Independence Arc to its former glory. The renovation project aims to address structural weaknesses, refurbish the exterior and enhance the surrounding landscape. This restoration marks a significant step towards valuing and preserving our cultural heritage. As the construction progresses, we will continue to bring you updates on the project's development. This renovation process is not only about maintaining the physical structure, but ensuring we honor the legacy of those who fought for Ghana's independence and remind future generations of this pivotal chapter in Ghana's history. Natalie Fort for GH1 News. That was my colleague Natalie Ford with that report there. Now, mobile money service providers have welcomed the latest Bank of Ghana's report on the fintech sector, which indicates a positive growth in both transaction volumes and subscriptions. The largest provider, MTN Mobile Money Limited, says the feat represents hope so huge, huge successes in Ghana's advancement in financial inclusion, especially among the informal sector of the economy. As the industry marks 15 years of financial inclusion, pioneers MTN is looking forward to a favorable regulatory environment that fosters innovation and creativity in the fintech space. Ultimate News' is Ivan Hitgood Fumado has the rest of the story. The total value of mobile money transactions for the first quarter of this year, as contained in the Bank of Ghana's fintech report, hit 1.2 trillion cities. This represents a 37% increase from the 901 billion recorded in the same period last year. General Manager for MTN Northern Business District, Nia Dote Mingle, points out that the rate of growth since MTN set the pace some 15 years ago, demonstrates how digital financial services have created financial inclusion for a majority of the population who were either underbanked or unbanked. It's been a long journey, a journey where, uh, which started with us having a very low percentage of, of banked people. And so this was a journey to ensure most Ghanaians were financially included in the financial sector. The exponential growth of MTN Mobile Money Services, which now stands at over 15 million active subscribers, has largely been driven by the goal of the fintech industry to lower the barriers that frontally shut out the informal sector, which employs more than 70% of the country's economically active workforce. One group which has enjoyed the dividends of mobile money transactions are traders who are hitherto targets of highway robbery. As part of activities to mark 15 years of financial inclusion, MTN is going heavy on mobile money fraud prevention. Addressed in a market launch, a detective with Ashanti Region Cyber Security Unit of the Ghana Police Service, Detective Sergeant Daniel Ofori, outlined a number of sophisticated schemes miscreants are adapting to defraud both users and agents of mobile financial services. <laughs> General Manager MTN Northern Business, Nia Dote Mengel, is positive the platform, which now accommodates varied financial transactions, including investment and insurance services, holds great potential for the future of Ghana's financial sector. And so it started with sending and receiving money and then saving money on your Momo uh, wallet. Today, it's, it's become a bigger platform for which all sorts of services um, are done on it. You pay, you receive, 
uh, you will do insurance, other financial transactions on it. Uh, my MTN app, for instance, has, has been revamped with uh, different services, like more services added onto it. And the ease with which you would be doing navigating the app, you know, has improved significantly. Except for the number of mobile money agents, which saw a decline, all other indicators, including user adoption, transaction volumes, and investment inflows, demonstrate a growing trend with industry experts predicting that the size of mobile money services in Ghana could hit $790 billion by the year 2030. Reporting for Star News, Ivan Hitkot Fumado, Ultimate FM, Kumase. Ivan is our Shanti Regional Correspondent with that report there. You are still listening to Star Today. And need I remind you that EIB is your election hub. It is now time to take you on the campaign trail. Good evening to you listening once again and welcome to your election hub. This is the campaign trail. Remember, if you live in Accra on Star 103.5 FM, in Kumase, it is Ultimate 106.9 FM, in Takrade, it is Empire 102.7 FM. We also live in Zebila on Zeps FM 92.9. And on Facebook, it is Star 103.5 FM. Around the world, it is starfm.com.gh. Welcome to the campaign trail. Welcome once again to the campaign trail. Let's start from the campaign trail from the camp of the governing New Patriotic Party. And the party is expected to launch its manifesto in Takrade on Sunday. Now ahead of the launch, Deputy Communications Director of the Dr. Baumia campaign, Agba Khomeini, has been sharing the party's preparedness. Agba Khomeini has also been sharing the party's preparedness for the manifesto launch on Sunday. The focus of this manifesto would be on business and jobs. And of course, the NPP has a record of creating the highest number of jobs in this fourth republic in the last seven to eight years. And so we have the credibility when we say to young people that we are the party of jobs. So in, on Sunday, the, the flag bearer, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, would be unveiling the details of the manifesto. And you would see that throughout the manifesto, what runs is the focus on private sector. All and right. it is understandable because we believe that we will not be able to deliver prosperity and opportunities for young people without the private sector. And so government, the next NPP government is going to focus heavily on that. If you remember at UPSA, our flag bearer said that he is going to cut down government spending 
by about 3% of GDP and hand that over to the private sector. So the private sector would be, would be on a PPP basis responsible for the provision of major infrastructure that government otherwise would have provided. Right. That would mean an expansion in their operations okay. and job opportunities for young people. Agba Khomeini is the Deputy Communications Director of the Dr. Baumia campaign. Let's move away from the NPP and go to the quarters of the NDC because some students of the Adaklu Senior High School in the Volta region are yearning for the return of John Dramani Mahama as the country's president. Now the students who spoke to Star News during the NDC's flag bearers visit to Adaklu on Thursday they believe the return of Mr. Mahama will ensure the completion of some stored infrastructure projects on their campus. There is more in this report, filed by Volta Regional Correspondent Faisal Abdurijisu. At the sound of the siren from John Mahama's convoy, these students of Dadaklu Senior High School rushed out of the school in a joyous display to catch a glimpse of the NDC flag bearer. Mr. Mahama was in Dadaklu for a community engagement as part of his four-day tour of the Volta region we started on Tuesday. In their hands were placards with inscriptions full of adulation for Mr. Mahama. But behind the excitement lies a myriad of challenges they think only John Mahama can resolve. Since I came to first year, the labs are not complete. We are finding it difficult to study. As a science student, I'm supposed to do practical from first year to third year so that when I go to Asi or something, I'll know how to cope with the practicals. But here lies the case. We don't have a science lab, we, have, we don't have an ICT lab, and the, we don't have a bus. When we came at first, we were even crying because the school was lacking facilities, so we were crying that we wanted to go back home. So I'm sure John Bahama is going to bring more facilities to the school. Some schools, they have big ICT labs and science laboratories, that gives them good experiments. But here in Adaklu, we don't have anything like that. Despite the MPP's strong accusations that John Mahama and the NDC will cancel the free SHS if they win the 2024 elections, these students think otherwise. We are begging on your behalf, come and complete our schools for us. And we know that uh, uh, free education is not going to be cancelled. We believe in him, we trust him. He shouldn't let us down, we believe in him. A former president would like to cancel the free SHS because it's a good thing. Because some of us that are coming from poor home, we are benefiting from it. Just that it's, it's helping though, but we are suffering more than the times that we are paying school fees. Because those that pay school fees, they have access to good facilities and they, their learning was good. But this time around, because of the free SHS, my school like this, we don't have furniture. Our science lab is more complete. I'm a science student. And here is the case. My three years in this school have not done any uh, pra uh, practical. The NDC flag bearer is expected to end his four day tour of the Volta region with community engagements in Central Town, South Town, Anglo, and the Keta constituencies. For GH1 News, Faisal Abdulidrisu. Now, from the camp of the NDC, let's head to the PNC, where the flag bearer aspirant for the People's National Convention, Bernard Mona, has filed nominations to contest the flag bearership of the PNC. The outspoken politician explained that his decision to run for president is as a result of the current economic challenges facing Ghana, which needs leadership to drive transformative change. Let's have a conversation, actually, with Hanan Abdul Adam, who has been with John Dramani Mahama for some updates. Hanan, thank you very much for your time this evening. Where are you on now and what can you report? Hello, Vanessa. Hanan, if you can hear me, I'm asking that where are you at the moment and what can you report? Well, Vanessa, we are currently in the Keta constituency where the flag bearer of the NDC is wrapping up a 4D campaign tour of the Vuta region. Intensive campaign from Hohoi, from Hu to Hohoi, from Pandu to Pekia, and then through to Akachi, at the Jome, Sadako Pair, and to the Japan. We went to um, Fajatu, amongst other areas, where the flag bearer of the NDC uh, is championing the uh, message of change ahead of the 2024 general election. One thing that is certain is that John, John Ramani Mahama believes that the wind of change is blowing and the people of the Vuta region are buying it into the message of change, are buying it into the idea of the 24-hour economy, are buying into the idea of the National Apprenticeship Program and also buying into the policy of mechanized agriculture 
where a lot of youth in the Vuta region would have jobs, aside the Okada businesses that they are doing, aside the normal farming activities that they are doing. He's also meeting with, he also earlier, sorry, met with fisher folks uh, in the coastal line of the Vuta region, where he assured them that Felix War will not be given to uh, third parties to be distributed to them, but will have it directly with a, a dedicated system or a centralized system without any bu bureaucratic tendencies. So the campaign of the NDC flag bearer ends today and then will return to the central region where the party will launch its manifesto on the 24th of August. Right. Hanan, we, we also understand that he made some comments about the catapults. What exactly did he say? Well, he mentioned that the catapult initiative is uh, something that the government of Nanado Dankwe Kukwado and Baumia didn't even intend in the first place to execute. He believed that it was just a charade. It was just something to court public attention. And he believes that uh, the MPP just used that particular initiative to deceive the people of the Vuta region uh, attempting to buy votes with that uh, particular project. But we passed through the, that particular area and how the, the, the site is when the sword was cut for it is still the same way it is. He also made reference to the Bokra inland port where he suspects some uh, malfeasance that indicate that both the catapult and the uh, Bonkra in Clampons in the Ashanti region is something that they are going to investigate. And again, he mentioned something that has to do with an initiative that was started by the uh, CPP government under Dr. Osadifu, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, and uh, refurbished under the John Mahama administration in 2016 before they left office. That is a commander sugar factory where the current trade and industry minister, KT Hammond, has brought in a private investor. And you remember just recently, the immediate past uh, majority leader of parliament, MP for Swami, uh, actually made a comment to our sister station in Kumasi. That is where uh, Bushnia FM indicated that that particular um, initiative or that particular strategic partner that the, the, the country is bringing on board is something that will yield to the benefit to the Ghanaian people, especially the people of Central Region, where just created. But the NDC flag bearer earlier this morning, when we had that press engagement, did indicate that he doesn't believe that this particular deal has gone through, you know, competitive tendering. He doesn't believe that there's any transparent processes. And he has warned the strategic partner to be very wary of that particular deal because when the NDC comes to transparent processes, and he has warned the strategic partner to be very wary of that particular deal because when the NDC comes into office, they are going to investigate that and ensure that any wrongdoing, anybody involved in any wrongdoing will be punished under the law. So again, he also mentioned about the fact that under his leadership, if the Ghanaian people voted into office, the journalists' rights will be protected. Journalists will practice without fear of intimidation whatsoever. He also mentioned about the fact that an initiative that he had started when he was in office to offer um, some support to journalists will be brought back if he's voted into office because he referenced at the time that some, you know, incentives were being given to journalists and he mentioned where la uh, laptops were being offered to journalists and other uh, gadgets. But that, the, that, that particular initiative was not implemented through and through until the executive office. And he anticipated that this government or the NPP government would you know, continue with that, and that is the general, Ghana Journalist Devo Development Fund. And he believes that he will bring back that fund where journalists will be supported, especially media houses that are unable to remunerate their employees better. So he also mentioned that uh, Ghana would be peaceful. He intends to inherit a Ghana that is stable. He, he intends to uh, inherit a Ghana that would move from the current situation where we are, where we are facing economic challenges, to a country where the economy grows and the teeming youth of Ghana get employment opportunities amongst others, Vanessa. Did he also give an indication that his party will sign the, the peace pacts? Well, at Sagawa, he mentioned something about elections, but he didn't mention anything that to do with the peace pacts. He said that the uh, Elizabeth Commission promised the parties that 
they were going to give them the voter album after July. We are in August and says that they've not received that. So after even the parties even submitting their 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 hard drives and whatsoever to the electoral commission and had made follow up to that effect, they have still not received that. But the key fact is something that we anticipate that as he mounts the speech here in Teta to climb as a rally, indeed, he is going to mention that. And this is something we as journalists following the campaign are drawing the attention to the managers of his campaign, that this is something that the country is discussing. And as a key stakeholder in this particular election, what are his thoughts regarding this particular issue? But the NDC still doesn't trust the electoral commission and they have, they have, they have, they have indicated that they are going to put the electoral commission on its toes to ensure that that particular uh, 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 guidelines that have been highlighted earlier is followed through and through. And we know that the electoral commission has also set a date, that is this coming Monday, to address the press. And one of the key issues they will be addressing is the concerns or the allegations raised by the Opposition National Democratic Congress. So we are still here and we are following through and we will bring listeners or uh, our cherished listeners up to speed as to what the NDC would officially say regarding the transfer. Right. Hanan, talking about the topical issues in the country at the moment, one of them is the National Day of Prayer and Thanksgiving. We understand that he's been trying to give some clarity on that matter. What has he been saying? Well, you know, when he announced that yesterday during a meeting with the leadership of the Muslim community and the Christian community in the Buddha region, um, it degenerated into... Uh, some sort of discussion and some misinformation according to him being peddled around or especially on social media. And he says that that day that will be set aside for that particular event will not be a holiday because actually people were asking and some people were making mockery of the fact that so the NDC intends to introduce another holiday when it has used office, especially when the country uh, is inundated with a lot of holidays or quote-unquote unnecessary holidays. But he explained that that is not going to be a holiday, but people will go to work on that day, and that event will still hold. And then another issue that he clarified has to do with um, the issue about the fact that he neglected some people uh, in, in, in the, in the Buddha region as part of the store. But he also clarified that it is not in his intention to do that at all. And there has not been any such such event and urge the public to uh, 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 to be focused on the issues at hand. That the NDC is actually, you know, fighting for in the 2024 general election. But then, Hanan, I mean, now that the president is ex-president is trying to round up his campaign with in Keta today, do we know if he is taking a break in order to launch the manifesto on August 24? Well, that has not been determined yet. And as far as we are concerned, we are wrapping up today. And he will, he's still going to be meeting, uh, you know, people tonight. And the people he will be meeting involve uh, regional party executives and constituency executives and then uh, party uh, stalwarts in the region, especially the Council of Elders, to discuss pertinent issues before he leaves tonight for the contractors with them. The next itinerary, as the running mate of the party continuing a market of the dictator who was visiting the dummy market on Monday. But the flag bearer, like you asked, indeed certainly would cost a bit because the next Saturday, the NDC would be in the central region to launch their manifesto for the 2024 general election. We know that Sunday, the MPP, which is the governing party, would also. Uh, been launching their uh, manifesto. So on Saturday, certainly the party would, would, would do that. And of course, we know that when he returns to Accra, and that is for sure, he will meet the manifesto committee of the party to finalize the processes ahead of that crucial event the NDC would hold in the central region on the 24th of August 2024. Right. Hanan, thank you very much. Hanan Abdul Adam is our man on the ground. He's been following M Mr. Mahama keenly of what he's been saying on the campaign platforms.
Let's now bring in the actual sound where the PNC flag bearer aspirant said his decision to run for president is as a result of the current economic challenges facing Ghana, which needs leadership to drive transformative change. Here is Bernard Mona addressing the party executives after filing his nomination. We have been the only political party amongst those political parties that were formed in 1992 that is yet to win political power. And yet we have contested every election. Over the years, we have sent messengers that the people did not receive. This time, the people themselves have identified who the messenger is. And that messenger is Bernard Mona. So having completed the processes, and I also take keen note that you are telling me very soon I will get the voters album. But you didn't wait for very soon to receive the payment. We have fulfilled our part of the bargain. We would expect that probably there will be any vetting. Soon after the vetting, we will have the full complement of the nominations. The Electoral Commission of Ghana, that is to conduct elections in 20, uh, December, has already come out with the voters register. That political parties are really fighting that it is in delay. How much more time do you need? Be able to compile an internal register. But this, because the media is here, I will not pursue it. But just to tell you that we're not taking anything lightly. We want to see the full complement of the voters register going into the election. <coughs> and I can show you that we'll be as decent as possible. But even as we are decent as possible, nobody should take our whiteness to mean that we cannot bite. But we can roar than the lion. But because we want peace to reign within the party, we have always conformed and we have been silent. Let no one take our silence to mean timidity. We are the boldest in the whole of Africa. Bernard Monam is a flag bearer aspirant of the People's National Convention. And that wraps up campaign trail on Election Hub. Start today. Thank you very much for tuning in. Start today. First, fast, and credible. To some other stories now, with the rising rates of unemployment and limited job opportunities, the Global Volunteers Call, Ghana is encouraging Ghanaian youth to leverage volunteering opportunities to acquire technical and soft skills. Now, speaking during an event to celebrate the exceptional celebration of volunteers across the country, founder of the Lepers Aid Committee, Reverend Father. Andrew Campbell, while commending the volunteers, emphasized the need for selflessness over fleeting material wants. Years after graduation, the majority of Ghanaian youth are at home due to lack of jobs. The Ghana Statistical Service estimates that 1.76 million people are unemployed. Some have resorted to casual jobs to make ends meet despite specialized training. While opportunities are few and far between, the president of the Global Volunteers Corps Ghana, Stephen Kwekudaku, says volunteer work is a great avenue to learn about the job market and eventually seize employment opportunities. Especially the youth must be encouraged more to indulge themselves in voluntary activities, voluntary actions, because through volunteerism, there are a lot of opportunities that will come your way. Through volunteerism, a lot of doors can open up to you. So let us all encourage ourselves to get ourselves involved in voluntary actions. Speaking during a ceremony to honor individuals and organizations who have demonstrated outstanding dedication and service to society, founder of the Lepers Aid Committee, Reverend Father Andrew Campbell, charged the youth to avail themselves for volunteer works that brings hope and impact to society. We're living in a very materialistic age. You know, it's not, it's not who you are any longer. It's what have you? What car do you ride? Where do you go for holidays? Where do you live? No, that's not important. It's who you are. It's who you are. And you know, this materialism is, is, is creeping into our society into our society that people just want, they want land, they want titles, they want honors, they want such and such. You know, it's creeping in and it's going to, you know, it's not helping us to see young people, so many young people today, they're being selfish. 
Grace Aka, Country Director of Global Volunteer Corps Ghana, also wants corporate organizations and individuals to support such volunteerism initiatives. We are calling upon partners to come and join us, to come and support. This, this is a good cause, you know, this is a good cause. Like um, uh, the Akosombo Spillage, uh, we went there for a whole one week to go and organize a medical outreach on our own. Uh, the evidences are there when you go uh, to um, their health service there to check the records and to know that indeed we have carried out this project. There is a lot we are doing. The ceremony was themed Inspiring Change, Reviving Volunteerism in Ghana. My colleague Obed King with that report today. Now the Vice Chancellor of the Accra Technical University, Professor Amevi Akakpavi, has called for a pragmatic overhaul of tertiary curriculum in the country to meet emerging trends in the technical space. According to him, most graduates find themselves lacking the requisite skills needed for the ever dynamic advanced technological labor market. He made these comments at the Tech Trends and Future Career Conference at the university. Unemployment rate in the country has seen a steady rise for some time now, with the average rate of the year 2023 at 14.7%. Governments have tried implementing policies to deal with the challenge, but it still persists. To deal with this head-on, Vice-Chancellor for the Accra Technical University, Professor Amevi Akakpovi, who spoke at an innovation conference, believes an artificial intelligence-based curriculum is the way to go. We have realized there is a challenge in the education ecosystem globally. Actually, the development in terms of employment are so fast and the curricula are, 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 keeping, you know, are not keeping at the same pace. What we are trying to say is that we find ourselves in the digital era where some technology have come up to a very strong extent that uh, you cannot do away with them. However, the traditional curricula we run, even especially in STEM education, still do not cover most of these things. On his part, Professor Rain Hermans underscored the importance of exploring cutting-edge technology in energy transition in line with climate resilience. We are searching for opportunities to collaborate with, um, for instance, Accra Technical University in Ghana. And our specialty in Vasa is uh, energy transition. So we have the biggest energy technology cluster in Nordic countries in Vasa region. Uh, there are several international companies like uh, Vertsila, ABB, Hitachi and Danfoss. And um, uh, we are really utilizing, for instance, AI methods in predicting the functionality of power grids. We are developing new renewable fuels used in uh, big e diesel engines in vessels and in power stations. Delivering the keynote address, the mayor of Accra, Elizabeth Saki, hints on plans of making Accra a smart city to deal with issues of security, sanitation, among others, leveraging technology. The conference discussions were centered on promoting global collaboration for sustainable business growth, showcasing emergence tech and career trends. That was my colleague Calvin Powell with our reports there. Now, commuters within Sekendi Takrade continue to grapple with potholes on some major roads in the metropolis as they go about their daily commuting. Now, some of such roads are Kujokrum to Fijai Road, Fijai Junction to Fire Service, Ifiakuma Number 9, as well as the Park Grant roundabout stretch. Intriguingly, Park Grant is amongst the big six who were recently celebrated on a holiday last August as Founders Day. Yet the Park Grant roundabout is riddled with potholes. Our correspondent in the Western region, Hajia Fati Karim, has more on how the potholes impact the livelihood of residents. Commuting on some roads in Sekendi Takrade is becoming increasingly stressful and challenging. The Park Grant roundabout has some of the worst stretches of road where it's drivers and commuters constantly complaining about the deteriorated state of the road. Here are some drivers and commuters sharing their frustrations about how the poor road conditions are impacting their daily lives and businesses. But the road is affecting us. We look at the way the dust uh, brings a lot of uh, disease. 
diseases. Moreover, there are a lot of bottles and uh, it affects the car. Personally, if you have to go to shop, it's affecting us a lot. And uh, I'll be happy if the government can uh, do something about it. Chris Moktagwe is a civil engineer and has been tracing the root causes of these potholes, highlighting issues such as poor drainage, among other factors. Let's take the power grant runabout for instance. It's, it's, it's a big mess. And this is because of the amount of vehicles that pass on it, the weight of those vehicles that pass over it, and the fact that the surface is not such that it's able to take water out. Because water keeps sitting there and you keep having these big trucks go in and out of that space, it's always going to be a problem there until the root cause is taken care of. Most of the drivers are perplexed over their frequent visit to the mechanic due to the poor nature of the roads. Al Hassan Muhammad is a local mechanic and has been explaining the specific parts of vehicles that are mostly affected by such road conditions. He further enumerates how expensive such regular maintenance can be for drivers. Hajia Fatih Karim is our correspondent in the Western Region and she filed that report. From the Western Region, let's head to Tishi and the indigenous people of Tishi traditional area have warned politicians against meddling in chieftaincy affairs to prevent conflicts during the Homo War Festival. Now, clashes between two groups over Tishi traditional stool led to at least three people sustaining varying degrees of injuries, sparking concerns. A spokesperson for the Tishi traditional leadership, Ni Norte Norte, Sum Sam Kuma, has appealed to stool occupants in to cease provoking the youth to engage in violence. There are more details in this report, filed by Star News' intern, Namoko. On Monday, 5th August, a group of police officers were subjected to a flood of curses from female priestesses in Teshin. The incident occurred after authorities banned outdoor noise making as part of the Homo War Festival activities by the occupant of the Teshi shrine. Calm was eventually restored, with residents returning to their daily routines. Ni Note Note Sankuma, chief of staff to the chief priest and spiritual overlord of the Teshi traditional area shared his thoughts. We were here yesterday in the morning. We saw a lot of policemen around with military armed to the teeth, with guns and I mean, I, I, I can't just imagine as if we were in a war zone. They push us off and they escorted some people to, to, to Manjano, of which the municipal chief executives in the person of Honorable Mordecai Akwashi We've had a meeting with him and he has told us that because of the volatile nature of the place, it's not going to allow anybody to have access to Manjano. So everybody should perform your custom and your tradition within your jurisdiction. If you are to be here around this time yesterday, you can't be breathing. The tear gas was flowing, the rubber bullets, the life bullets were flowing and a lot of people get hurt. It is the Wulomo who has to lead, but you can't take the Wulomo's right and give it to his choristers, like you are taking the right of the presiding bishop and giving it to the choir master. The Asafwache Abuaboni echoed similar sentiments, cautioning politicians to respect the culture and traditions of the people. We are pleading with politicians. Politicians say the chiefs should not mingle themselves into politics. Vice versa, the politicians should also not mingle themselves in traditional issues. When the politician comes into traditional issues, this is the result that we get. And Tessie, for instance, it is the politicians who have made Tessie what it, 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 it is now. Staying from traditional issues so that the greater Accra region, especially the Ghana people, will have their peace. For GH1 News, Namoko Teshi. Namoko is Star News is in 10. Star today, first, fast, and credible. You're still listening to Star Today. Let's do sports now. And thousands of sports enthusiasts have today been impressed by the state of the newly constructed Takwa and Abusu Sports Stadium in the Takwa municipality. The stadium was construct constructed by the Goldfield Ghana Foundation with funding from Goldfield G Ghana's Takwa and Damang Mines. The facility is expected to become the home grounds of former Ghana Premier League champions, Midyama SC. 
The rehabilitation work on the TNA Stadium started in January 2020 and was completed in June this year at a cost of $16.2 million. This significant investment by the Goldfields Ghana Foundation has transformed the then 400-seater football park into an 8,000-plus-seater world-class stadium capable of hosting international matches. Speaking at the handing over ceremony earlier today, Vice President and Interim Managing Director of Goldfields Ghana Limited, Elliot Trum said this gesture is a testament to the foundation's investment in the socio-economic development of their host communities and evidence to what positive mining can do. He further noted that the facility meets all international standards as certified by FIFA. The Goldfields Ghana Foundation invested $16.2 million to reconstruct and refurbish what was once a 400-seat football park. The Foundation's commitment to improving conditions in our stakeholder communities is evident in the numerous projects initiated and completed over the years, from infrastructure to education, enterprise development and training. The Taquan Abolso Sports Stadium is our most recent addition to the tallest. In terms of investment in our host communities, the Foundation has dispensed over $100 million in the past two decades to ensure sustainable socioeconomic development. On his part, the Minister of Sports, Mustafa Yusuf, noted the edifice is a testament to partnership and collaboration in driving community development. He said it would provide them a platform in harnessing talents. The elated minister extended government appreciation to the benefactors. He further emphasized that the maintenance of the facility should be prioritized. I want to thank Goldfields Ghana Limited for single handedly funding this edifice, this stadium, for the good people of Tampa, Israel, the Western region, and Ghana as a whole. The contractors have done a very good work, and I, as I said in my remarks, the National Sports Authority and the Municipal Assembly will make sure that they maintain the facility well so that it will bring the benefit that we are all uh, uh, yearning for. The Member of Parliament of Takwa Insyayim, Anabu George Mirikuduka, in his address noted that the reconstruction of the Takwa and Aboso Sports Stadium is a testament of how corporate social responsibility can be impactful. He said this will act as a major promotion for sport in the Takwa enclave. He further urged the National Sports Authority, in conjunction with the Municipal Assembly, to devise an appropriate strategy to ensure the proper management of the edifice. The people of Takwa are aware that I started talking about how or the need to uh, facelift this facility uh, way back in 2008 and re-engineered it in 2019 where we had a soft cutting. And the people of Takwa are proud of this edifice. Uh, I am so elated today because of this facility. My happiness also was on how uh, collaboratively the sports authority and that of the assembly are going to manage this facility together and, and that gives me some excitement as part of the commissioning a ceremonial match was played between staff of the goldfields ghana and the professional footballers association of ghana with midyama sc currently playing a santa Cotico football club now the national 100 meters record holder has announced he is set to team up with the renowned athlete, athletics coach who is the coach of Olympics bronze medalist Fred Kelly. As a he is relocating to California where he will learn he will team up with the Olympic 100 meters bronze me medalist Fred Kelly under Bolton's guidance. As a sets the national record of 9.90 seconds back in 2022 but has since stagnated in form. The 26-year-old has not broken the 10 seconds barrier in over two years, something he expects to change under Bolton. Michael Ateta says, well, now Michael Ateta says Arsenal's players have told him they want more this season as they look to deny Manchester City a fifth consecutive Premier League title. The Gunners have finished second to City in the past two leagues campaigns and were just two points behind Pep Guardiola's side last season. Arsenal faces Wolves at Emirates Stadium in their final match of the season on Saturday. And Ateta says his side are relishing the start of their title bid. Mikel Ateta has heaped praises on the new defender, Ricardo 
Calafori ahead of the start of the season. Very happy. Um, it took a while. He's a player that we have monitored uh, for over a year. He was adamant. Let me know when you're ready. My bags are ready and I just want to come to Arsenal. That were his words. And when you have that feeling, you know, and, and someone with that, when that willingness to join us, to make us better and, and that determination, that's something really powerful. And I think as a club, we should be very proud of that. We were really short in the back line in last season in terms of numbers, and we demanded so much for them. Uh, Willie, for example, played every minute of, of, the, of the Premier League, and, uh, and we believe that we have to be much more protected. We identify him as a, as a player, as a talent that, uh, that can give us skills and qualities that uh, are going to make us better, and still just signing a, a player with a huge uh, capacity still to develop. And he's obviously another very versatile defender yeah. to your back line. Do you see him primarily as a left back, as a centre back, or not really anyone in his position? Both positions, especially, and, and the way we want to play and the things that we want to evolve um, in our game model is a player that is going to fit really well for, for what we want. Now, meanwhile, Manchester United will host Fulham at the Old Trafford in the first game of the season at 7 p.m. tonight. Before we go, let's take some updates from the foreign front now. And thousands of workers in India are on a march to demand justice for a trainee doctor who was raped and murdered at a medical college in Kolkata. Now, in solidarity with the deceased, doctors and representatives of various medical organizations are protesting at various locations in the country. Aside justice, the protesters are demanding better security at medical campuses and hospitals, the Indian Medical Association says, which is the largest medical organization with 400,000 members, have also stated they will implement a 24-hour shutdown on Saturday, August 17, 2024, to express their determination. And that is how we end this evening's broadcast. Thank you very much for staying with us. For more news updates, of course, do log on to starfm.com.gh. I am Tutuwa Danso. And a thank you to my producer, Prince Isien. Have a lovely weekend.